So, um, one of the things that we're doing and uh, CUNY will continue to do is to try to prepare students for career success, right? Giving you in the classrooms the abilities that will help you to have a successful career, right? Uh, some of this seems obvious, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes both faculty and uh, students and administrators, right, need to be reminded about how, you know, what it is exactly, explicitly, that, you know, we're doing in the classroom that translates to, right, career success skills. And NAIS, the National Association for Colleges and Employers, have, has this very useful list of, uh, you know, career-ready uh, competencies, yeah? And there's eight of them. Uh, we're not gonna go through all of them in great detail. We are going to list them, look carefully at a couple of them, and then uh, we're gonna have actually a practical exercise uh, in one of these areas, which is gonna be critical thinking, which I know you all love, okay? Um, so what are the, um, the eight uh, 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 NAIS competencies? You have uh, career and self-development. You have equity and inclusion. Uh, teamwork, communication, leadership, technology, critical thinking, and professionalism. <coughs> um, so uh, here they are in, uh, in great detailed, uh, if uh, you know, one of them particularly calls your attention, uh, we would be grateful if on those large post-it notes that we have set up there, uh, we have charpies uh, that, um, where you can write, please, if you are already doing uh, some of this preparation in the classroom, or if students, you want to see more of one of these uh, 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 skills uh, being developed in the classroom. So if you can put them up there on those poster boards, I will, you know, uh, post-it notes, I will greatly appreciate it. I will greatly appreciate it. Um, so uh, what is uh, career and self-development, right? Uh, this is when you proactively develop, you know, you know, uh, yourself and your career through continual personal and professional learning, right? So basically, what are your super strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are areas that uh, you need to, you know, develop, develop for? Uh, communication, right? Communicating clearly and effectively, right, is very important, not only in the classroom, but of course, in the real world. Uh, critical thinking, yeah, my favorite, right? Uh, so, you know, this is the skill that allows you to analyze, right? Analyze not only data, but analyze arguments, right? Yeah, and look for, you know, um, look for, for arguments that are, you know, that do not commit crimes against <laughs> logic, yeah? And there's a lot of that out there. Just read the New York Times, yeah? Um, so uh, what are some of the sample behaviors, right? Uh, making decisions to solve problems, right? Uh, gathering and analyzing information, right? Uh, uh, being able to look forward, right? Trying to right? Uh, look ahead, right? Of what might develop, right? In the future, right? Um, other sample behaviors, Right, uh, accurately interpreting and summarizing data. Right? Uh, uh, effective communication, right, is also part of critical thinking. This is one of the reasons why we do critical thinking. And uh, and uh, multitasking, if you can do that, I can't, but you know, apparently it's possible. Um, equity and inclusion, right. Uh, demonstrate awareness, attitude, knowledge, and skills required to equitably engage and include people, right? 
from different local and cultural groups. Yeah. Uh, leadership, very important, right? Uh, recognizing and capitalizing on personal and team strengths, right? To achieve organizational goals. Professionalism, yeah? Uh, knowing your work environment, right? Uh, knowing work environment, sorry, the fair gravity uh, understand and demonstrate effective work habits and act in the interest of uh, the larger community and workplace. Teamwork, right, very important. Now you know why uh, uh, Professor Matias Bulnes makes you do some, some, some group work. Uh, and uh, so this is where you m build and maintain uh, collab collaborative relationships, right, uh, to work effectively towards common goals. Uh, technology, very important, right? I know that students feel very comfy with some, right? With some uh, uh, um, technological uh, media, uh, but, um, you know, technology keeps changing, right? So we need to, right, stay ahead of the curve. Now, I know what you're saying, right? We got this. <laughs> this is George A. College of Criminal Justice. This is what we do. So, as I pass the baton to, to Manura, uh, I want you to please think about the following two questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, think of one career readiness competency that you're already implementing in your classes, in your programs, to help your students be career ready, right? For students, Please think about right one such skill uh, that uh, you uh, have encountered, right, and have developed in the classroom or programs here at the college. The second one is uh, uh, one career readiness competency, right, that would would um, you know you you hope to incorporate in your life in your career. In your in your classroom, in your programs, and whatever. Yep, yep. So uh, hope hopefully people can hear me at the back. So what we just heard were kind of career readiness competencies, right? But the three of us are part of the uh, career success fellowship. Um, organized by the CUNY Office of Transformation. And one of our challenges, uh, whether you're a student or faculty or in some other position at John Jay, one of our challenges is uh, to kind of convert these competency areas into ways that will, will be impactful uh, for readying our students um, for different careers. And so um, these five high impact areas have been identified by um, you know, CUNY Office of Transformation. Uh, and so, let's see. The first one is syllabus and curricular revision. And so, a lot of faculty are involved in this, but essentially this is about converting these NACE competencies um, you know, and incorporating them into the syllabus to revise curriculum and to include more industry specific skills. So that's one goal. The other goal is student support. Um, so yes. And under student support, um, you know, how do we support students to kind of guide them in this path of being career ready? So you know, you'll see some of these things hopefully in, in, in the workshops that we have coming up uh, in the hands-on activities but provide access to career guidance mentors, uh, provide um, sort of degree maps that students can use, um, you know, but also make timely referrals to things like mental health, uh, which are also part of this support. And um, so, um, but also work-based learning, and I'm sorry I'm going through these one by one, but uh, I found them very useful as I was thinking through how to incorporate this into my department, which is English. 
Uh, but the way that, uh, at least in our year, the you know, CUNY Office of Transformation selected us was to kind of represent the humanities, represent uh, you know, uh, uh, STEM and other fields, and, and Denise is from public management, Enrique is from philosophy, to kind of to do a, an interdisciplinary kind of thing. But essentially, work-based learning is to integrate work-based learning projects, internships, uh, or kind of apprenticeships into the courses and degree programs. Uh, the other one is kind of obvious, employer engagement. Um, and this is really, it talks about arranging classroom visits for industry reps, invite industry reps into um, you know, the classroom, but also you know, have people from our college <coughs> participate in advisory boards to inform the <coughs> curriculum and so on and so forth. So that kind of makes the, the, the relationship between our students and industries uh, bring it a little bit closer. And the last one uh, that were, was identified was the continuous improvement and utilization of data. And this is about using labor market data within the classroom, within assignments, use student outcomes data to inform course content and degree programs, and administer um, student surveys to find out what is resonating with students. And uh, through the last year, as we were working on this fellowship, um, there were various kinds of data made available to us, and we are in the process, and hopefully we'll be passing on the baton to the next year's um, career success fellows. These things cannot be done in a day, as we all know, but being aware of these five things, and just once again, syllabus and curricular revision, student support, work-based learning, employer engagement, and the utilization of data. This is how we are thinking of incorporating um, the NACE competencies into our curriculum. And so, you know, that's all I had, and I don't want to take up too much time because we hopefully have more exciting things to do, exciting things coming up. There's always more exciting <laughs> with uh, curry, curry or success battles. Okay, so uh, we're going to do now, uh, I want to talk about one particular argument, yeah, which is known as the argument from analogy. You all use it. We all use it. This is the most commonly used argument in the world. And believe it or not, most of the time that people use it, again, read the New York Times, Read uh, The Guardian, read The New Yorker. About 80, 90% of the time, people get it wrong, okay? So I'm gonna give you uh, a hack into the argument from an okay. Um Just briefly, more, more uh, you know, more technically, what do philosophers, right, think when they think about critical thinking, right? So critical thinking is done for the purpose of making up one's mind, right? About what to believe, and more importantly, what to do, how to act. Um, the person engaging in the thinking is trying to fulfill certain standards, right? Of adequacy and accuracy, which is appropriate, right? To the thinking. The thinking, fulfills, right, the relevant standards to some threshold. Uh, look at what Plato said about arguments from, from analogy. Sebastian, do you mind reading us what Plato said about arguments from analogy? Thank you. Professor. <laughs> arguments that make their point by means of similarities are imposters, and unless you are on your guard against them, will quite readily deceive you. Right? So watch out for these guys. They are, you know, they can be deceiving. Yeah. Uh, Mia, do you mind telling us what Freud said about arguments from analogy? Sure. Thank analogy you. Analogy decide nothing. That is true, but they can make one feel more happy. Okay. Right? Because the way that arguments from analogy work, right, uh, they declare that two items are the same in some respect, they're gonna be the same in another respect. Okay. Um, 
they can make you feel at home, right? Very comfy, right? And for that reason, they can be very persuasive. Okay? Uh, we're not going to go through right through all of this, but I'm giving for professors who are here, right? This is a little exercise that you can incorporate into any of your classes because you can pull an argument uh, from analogy from sociology, from psychology, from English literature, from criminal justice, even hard science. So we're, I'm just going to tell you what is the correct uh, form of arguments from analogy. Um, uh, here is an example. Uh, Professor Matias Bulnes, do you mind reading us this example? Thank you. <coughs> During World, World War I, the Socialist Party distributed uh, leaflets to the recent drafters, urging them to oppose the draft. The draft, they contended, violated the constitutional amendment against voluntary servitude. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, argued that they did not have the right to circulate the leaflets during wartime. The right to free speech, he asserted, quote, would not protect a man from falsely shouting fire in the theater and causing a panic, end quote. Since in both cases, both the words used created a clear and present danger, he concluded that the right to free speech did not protect the socialists in expressing ideas that might harm the, the war effort. Thank you very much. Have you ever heard this one before? Yeah, clear and present danger, right? Okay, so um, look how the argument begins, right? With something very familiar. Right? Of course we don't have the right to falsely shout fire in a crowded right, uh, uh, theater. Right? Uh, but then invites you to conclude the same about something which is less familiar. Right? Uh, under certain circumstances, according to this argument, right, uh, we don't even have the right to explain to others our interpretation of the US Constitution. Uh, and uh, incidentally, the, we, we, we are the, being, uh, calling it in a crowded theater, uh, Holmes is usually quoted, but that's a misquote, but probably that's what he had in mind. Yeah. Okay, so um, why are they so enticing? Why are they so convincing? Right. Uh, because of their very nature, right? The structure of the argument matches the structure of our brain, right? Yeah? And they use uh, what I call to, um, you know, uh, quick and dirty shortcuts, right? That we are very familiar with, that we're always using, right? In our, in our lives, right? Uh, because they depend on the vividness, right? Of the example, you know, shouting fire in a crowded field, right? Uh, but also another quick and dirty shortcut that they use is um, the familiarity, right? Uh, the familiarity short. So again, they're custom made to the way that our mind operates. And this, right, makes them susceptible, right? Um, we make, make us, sorry, especially susceptible to them and heightens the importance, right? Of being able to evaluate them effectively. So what's the correct form of arguments from analogy, right? Here's a warning. Not every time that a writer or a thinking is using an analogy is using, you know, is trying to make an argument, right? He's trying to uh, uh, use the argument from analogy. So we can use analogies, but we, we, we don't necessarily make arguments. Uh, Take, for example, uh, this example. Uh, Professor Inguar pa Paulino, can I bother you if you can read us this? Sure. Thank you very much. Not 
trying to establish any conclusions, right, based on the similarity. He's just simply noting a similarity. So never jump, right, to the conclusion that an analogy, again, introduces an argument unless there really is, at least implicitly, right, a conclusion. Okay. When there is an argument from analogy, as in the preceding free speech argument, it can typically be clarified according to the following formal form. Yeah? And we read this premise one, A is F, object A has property F. So A is F and G, right? Thing A has two properties, right? F and G. <coughs> Second premise, right? Object B also has property F. And therefore, right, those three dots mean therefore, the conclusion, oh, B also has, right, property G, okay? Um, so again, right, A and B are named letters, they are things, right? Um, we call them the two analogs, formally, right? The two things, or it can be a group of things, classes of things, that are said to be analogous, that are said to be simple, right? A, we call the basic analog, right? And we, it's the basic analog because this is presumably the one that we're very familiar with. Uh, B is called the inferred analog, right? And this is the one that the argument draws a conclusion about, right? So if we look in the free speech argument, right? Uh, A, right, the basic analog is gonna be the familiar one, right? Shouting fire in a theater. And B is the inferior analog is gonna be expressing ideas that might harm the word A. Okay. Again, right, just to remind you, F and G are property letters. F is the basic similarity, right? The property that the two analogs, A and B, share, presumably without controversy, right? Uh, in the free speech argument, the basic similarity is they create a clear and present danger. And G, the inferred similarity, the property that the inferred analog is purported to have on the grounds that the basic analog has it, is it's not protected by the right to free speech, right? Yeah, in that, and is the unfair similarity, right? In that uh, free speech argument. Uh, here's one good way to clarify the argument, right? right? Remember the formal fashion of the argument, we go premise one, right? Falsely shouting fire in a theater creates a clear and present danger and is not protected by the right to free speech. Expressing ideas that might harm the war effort creates a clear and present danger, right? What's the conclusion? Expressing ideas that might harm the war effort is not protected by the right to is that clear? Okie dokie. Okay. Now, there are variations, right, of this model that are very common. The basic infer analog will sometimes include more, right, uh, more items, right? Um, take, for example, this one. Uh, manatees must be mammals, since whales and dolphins, like manatees, are sea creatures that give life birth, and whales and dolphins are definitely mammals. Right? So in this case, right, the basic analog, the content of A, is whales and dolphins, a class, right? Not just one thing. Uh, but also, right, uh, Either the basic similarity or the inverse similarity may include more than one property, right? Here's an example. 
Manatees must be mammals, since whales, like manatees, are sea creatures that give life birth and that nourish their young on the mother's milk, and whales are definitely mammals. Okay? So in this example, the basic similarity in the content of F is sea creatures that give life birth and nourish their young on the mother's milk. Okay. Um, now, you're reading a text for your class, you're reading the New York Times, you're doing some research, right? How to clarify an argument from analogy is very simple. Trust me, right? Straightforward, yeah? So it is easy to begin identifying the analogs, right? The two things that are supposed to be, right, uh, similar. And we just plug in, we insert, right? Um, the one that is more familiar, the one that is not in question in the A position. Right? Uh, the basic analog. Uh, and then in the position of B, we're going to plug in right, the inferred analog. Yeah? Then you insert the basic similarity, right? the properties of the two analogs, F and G, right? in their mm -hmm. correct places. Right? Um, uh, Right? In both premises, this is F. Right? <coughs> the characteristic right, that is you know, seemingly uncontroversial. And then finally, right, you insert the inferior similarity into the first premise, G, and the conclusion. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK. Here's a. Last note of warning. Sometimes arguments from analogy are what we call empty memes. Uh, in other words, uh, there is an implicit statement, right? And it's usually in the second premise, right? Uh, the one that establishes the similarity. Uh, this is because arguers, right, often assume, rightly, that the similarity between the two analogs is so obvious that, you know, it goes without saying, right? as they say. Okay. So here's an example of, a, right, of, of one such argument. Uh, suppose I say to a friend of mine whose son is about to enter first grade, since John behaves respectfully towards his parents, he will surely treat his teachers with respect. The basic analog is John's parents. The unfair analog is John's teachers. right? And the unfair similarity is are treated with respect by John, right? But what is the basic similarity, right? It's nowhere to be seen here. So we must identify a relevant trait that parents and teachers have in common, namely that they are authority figures. Yeah? And here's the clarified argument, right? We use brackets just to remind ourselves that this was an implicit, right? Uh, you know, an implicit uh, premise, right? Um, I won't read it, but you get the idea, right? Okay. So, what's the guideline here, right? Uh, structure arguments from analogy when it would be loyal to do so by identifying four things, right? The basic and unfair analogs and the basic and infer similarities, the properties, right? Then you plug them in, just you know, cut and paste, cut and paste, right? Uh, insert them into the proper form. Remember, the second premise, right, uh, is often implicit. This is the one that declares the basic similarity. Okay. Um, So, are you ready to do an, ex an exercise? Yeah, Sebastian is going like, yes, yes, <laughs> right? So, right, the sample answer is going to look like this, right? You're going to write down the basic analog mm -hmm. of an argument that I'm going to give you, the fair analog, yeah? The basic similarity, 
and the inferred similarity, right? And then you're going to put them in formal fashion. First premise, second premise, conclusion. Okay? You got your pens and, and, and paper ready? Um, where's my, I'm missing my argument here. Sandra, do you mind reading us that, that, that? This is your sample exercise, okay? Expressions of shock and sadness came from other coaches and administrators following the announcement by Tulane President Umar Kelly that the school planned to drop its basketball program in the wake of the alleged gambling scheme and newly discovered NCAA violations. Coach Jim Killingsworth of TCU said, I think they should deal with the problem, not do away with it. If they had something like that happen in the English department, would they do away with that? I feel like they should have tried to solve their problems. Okay. So, do you see that this is an argument from analogy? Yeah? So, right, your guideline is to put it in formal fashion, right? So identify, I'll leave it there for a minute, identify, right? This is what your answer is gonna look like, right? What's the basic analog? The unfair analog, the basic similarity, the unfair similarity, right? And then you're going to do the substitution, the plugging in, first premise, second premise, therefore the conclusion. I can go back and forth if you need to go back to the argument. Couple of minutes. Are we ready? Yeah? Okay, so um, who would like to volunteer their uh, sample answer? What's the basic analog? He teaches uh, <laughs> formal logic and, cri and critical thinking. Professor Bullness, yes? Yeah. The, the basic analog? Yeah. The English department. Bravo, the English department. Right? Okay. Um, what is the unfair analog? Not Professor Bullness. <laughs> what is the unfair analog? It's okay to make mistakes. I made a million a day. You're amongst family, you're among friends. Yes? The basketball program, bravo, right? What is the unfair similarity?
Professor Bullness. We are allowed to deal with these problems. So, sorry. Oh, sorry. The, basic the basic similarity. I'm sorry, I, I, I clicked by mistake. Go ahead. Uh, the basic similarity is that uh, they are university programs. Good, right? And then the inverse similarity, as you rightly said, right? So we're going to do that. And your answer should look like this, uh, right? And, oops, thank you very much. I will put up this in the Teaching and Writing Center site so that you have the slides. I want to give credit to an open source book. I use this open source book because we all can access it, right? Yeah? At uh, the University of Minnesota. Thank you. switch gears a little bit and talk about something more what should I say? Hands on. <laughs> I don't know. But so our charge was to use the eight competences and couple them with the high the five high impact areas and try to reach as many students as possible. So we felt that the best way to do that was to use our classrooms. So we use classes to embed career readiness. So I'm going to give you an example of what we did with CJM 101. So I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to talk about something we've been working on, which is a mapping of um, career readiness activities in years one to four. And then I'm going to give you an example of how we integrated that into a classroom in one of our classes. And then I'm going to ask you if you can do something similarly, where you put um, develop a learning outcome and then match that with an activity. So I think in that way, everybody can have at least one that they can integrate into a class, whichever class it is. My recommendation is to start with the um, required courses and start as early as the introductory course, which is the 101 courses. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of these things because you know of the trees, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> but I do have a few. So some of my students won't get any. <laughs> but I'll pass it around, we can share. going to look at, a, it's a draft, so it's a work in progress. We welcome feedback from you guys. Four year timeline for careers. So in year one, we're anticipating things such as dedicating a section of your required classes to your career readiness. And it could be talking about it, asking students, what are their plans? Right? It could be putting up something on your class Blackboard site or Brightspace site that has a list of careers in the, in the profession. So in CJM, for instance, 101, we have a number of 
corrections classes because it's a system, right? We have corrections, of course, and we have the police, um, the um, law enforcement, and we have jobs in those three segments. And students actually go and present on those careers. And in my class, we had two students who presented, did a fantastic job. I mean, they blew it out of the park. That brought on other students. And so I just saw one of my students from last year outside, and he's telling me now that he's doing all kinds of things. Because we tell them that you can volunteer for something. It exposes you to different um, a network of people who we didn't know before, right? So they're doing that. They're also mentoring other students, right? Because we've exposed them to that, not only to become mentors, but we also mentored by other people, so they've done that. So in year one, we have things like consider having a career development class in your major, it could be called career planning, right, where it dedicates a class to it in your major, or it could be just integrating it in different classes. Year two, we encourage people, so year one, they're thinking broadly about careers. They're not set on what they're doing yet, they're exploring. Year two, when they're sophomore students, they're actually encouraged to narrow the career options, to find jobs that fit their major, to collect information about the jobs, etc. We can help. We can bring in um, visitors from the different fields or areas of specialization in the major. They can expose students. And we've found that um, folks who actually attended John Jay and come back to talk to students are the best ambassadors for this thing because they're telling students we were sitting right where you are. Right? And students are engaging with the visitors because they're asking, what school do you go to? Oh, I know that school. Did you do this? You know, so there's a connection, an immediate connection with students and the visitors. So it's up to you what visitors you want to in invite to your classes, but it must match the majors that you have. Uh, then we also develop things like internships, and it could be class-based internships. So we know students, the same students over and over get exposed to the internship opportunities, scholarship opportunities, the same students. We want to widen that to all students, and so the best way we found that that could be done was to integrate it into the classroom. A session where they're doing X, and it could be a semester long, it could be a year long, you decide what you're doing. But in that way, more students are exposed to it. Um, in their junior year, students are asked to construct a timeline and an action plan concerning their career and po plans post-graduation. And we actually do this in the first year. So they're not doing a detailed, intense plan, but they're doing a plan in the first year to become familiar. That's going to be tweaked over time. They're developing resumes, but that's going to be tweaked over time and perfected, hopefully by the time they leave, right? And then, so these are just examples, ideas for you that you can plug into your courses. And by the, the senior year, we're asking them, encouraging them to make frequent uh, office visits to career services, learn how to conduct job searches, prepare a portfolio of their best jobs, doing mock interview, revising the resume, updating the resume, uh, getting um, newspapers or journals, publication, LinkedIn, <coughs> Handshake, all of these things that they become familiar with. And then we're asking them to keep good records, we're asking them to develop computer skills. So we're asking them, by the time they're done, I think they're, they're kind of rounded in a way where they're <coughs> seasoned into what career readiness is, and they can now take it by themselves and, and run with it. They can do, it doesn't have to be scripted and guided. They can actually now say, hmm, I want to do X, Y, Z, here's where I start to look. Let me look at my resume again and see what that match. Think critically about career. So when they're writing a letter, 
for instance, when they're applying to a job that's critical thinking, so they have to think about what skills they have, how does it match the details of the job requirements that they have, how do they align the re cover letter, the resume, and you know, if it's an email that they're using, how do they align all of that to make sure that they get the job, <coughs> right? Because it's very competitive. So things like that, From, if we start in year one, by year four, students are more able to do it by themselves because they've integrated, integrated it throughout. So this is it's a quick dirt and dirty, it's a detailed list, but we're, and we're still developing it. So moving from this, we try to apply it in one of our classes. And so I didn't bring this either because it's like the trees <laughs> yeah, we're trying to save. But so what we took, because of what we did, which was expose them to the careers in the field, ask them to do a career trajectory, you know, we bring in speakers, etc. They do a resume, they do a cover letter, we bring in people to actually help us. Miss Ferdy was one of those people. So they're talking about creating a LinkedIn profile for yourself. They are um, writing a cover letter. They're updating their resume, they're writing the resume for the first time. And when you see initially, some of them, they're rough. But by the end, when they have to submit everything together as <laughs> the final assignment, it's, you know, it's better, it's more refined. So, so we took that approach where we're looking at the entirety of the process, introducing it. And so our learning outcome here was examine careers and evaluate career progression within criminal justice management. Right, so we had something concrete to measure. Now students submit a final paper that they do in parts. And that final paper pull everything together. And now we can assess it, right? That's what the learning outcome is supposed to do. It's supposed to help you to um, assess, collect data, and tweak what you do. So we created this um, career learning outcome. And then if you look at the classes that we do weekly, I'll give you an idea, just an idea of some of the things that we do weekly. So the first week that we have, it's just organizing. And so here in the first week, students are organizing teams in the first week. And those teams are supposed to present something, because now we're developing communications and presentation skills. And so the teams go out through the semester. But, so we organize everything from the beginning. And students know what topics they're doing and therefore they have to work together. They have to know how to read. We brought in Dr. Peters, talk to students about how to read effectively, right? And they're doing presentation. Our students presented us how to present, why they present, etc. cetera. And, and so students do the presentations throughout the week. And then we go into week three. So, and we're interspersed these things with actual work, right? So week two, we're actually doing ethics. It's the core of criminal justice management because of, there's a lot of discretion, a lot of things go on that shouldn't go on. So ethics is grounding them. So week two, we do ethics. Week three, career readiness. And so we do all of it. The LinkedIn, we do the resume, we do the cover letter, handshake, right? And students know to actually when they're developing a resume to break it down into the elemental units, right? So they can better have a handle on what, what it is that they know, how they know it. We even do um, a career psychology test. <laughs> it's like, just to make students aware, it's a free thing that you get online. But students have an idea, oh, this is my strong area, this is not my strong area, this is where, you know, this kind of thing, or what's your superpower things like that. They're thinking. That's what you want students to do. And then they go into doing models on the criminal justice system. So we're, we're actually doing real work, even though we focus strong on the other real work that they, they, they need to develop. And so we go through and every week students are presenting. And then we have them doing the career trajectory. 
And that's the first part of it where they're thinking about what is it that they want to do? Why do they want to do it? What obstacles could they face? So again, that's critically thinking about the career. And then that coupled with the psychology test, the students may say, this is actually not the major for me. <laughs> and, and there are students who have said that. This is not the major. I think I belong over here. I belong over there. And that's good. I, I don't have a problem. They say, that's good. <laughs> you do that, but no, you're empowered, right? You can do that. So the career trajectory is divided up in two parts. They do one before, after they do a blog, an introductory blog. They say, I want to do this. And you know, that's it. Because, I want to do it because. That's it. And then they build, build, and then finally they put, there's another part to it. What do I need to do? What kind of training do I need to get to do this? Right? And they have to really think, do I get an internship in between? How do I go about getting that? Do I connect with people? Who would be the best person? Is there a boot camp that I need to go to? Does John Jay have it? Can I attend it? You know, this kind of thing. So that's how we do it. And then the final exam, that's it. We have in week like 14 that we have, we have a workshop. And this is like presentations from students, reading, constitution, whatever it is. But student, this is student-led. Students are moderating this. So they're taking all the skills, right, from the beginning. They're moderating the session themselves. They're asking questions. They're answering questions. They're organizing a presenter. They're actually applying what they learn in the class. So those are some activities that we actually translate the learning outcomes to activities and then they're graded. So we actually know a student getting what they're supposed to be getting and let's stop there. So if we have time, I'd like to maybe, so if we go back to the in introductory slide, the eight competences, you don't have to integrate all eight competences in one class. You can do one competence. So Enrique, for instance, was doing critical thinking. That's what he was focused on throughout this thing. My thing was looking at how do I get the competences to as many students as possible, right? How do I operationalize what I'm thinking about career readiness and career success? So we integrated it into the program, actually, the entire program. And that's where like, this idea came from. You know, what should they know in year one? What should they know in year two, year three, and year four? So if you go back to the early slides, the eight competences, you can do career self-development in your introductory class. That's all you, you can focus on, right? And in that, um, students are reflecting they're coming up with ideas. They're exploring career, you know, things like that. They're learning to advocate for themselves. They're learning to communicate more effectively. It could just be that, right? Or it could be teamwork. It could be any of these. You may introduce two. It could be career development, and it could be professionalism. And, and you do that. So it's up to you. It's up to your creativity and your imagination as to how you want to use the eight competences in your class or in your program. They focusing on the required courses makes it so that you're articulating throughout the four years and students are exposed over four years. Because as Enrique has said before, it's not a one time and done. It has to be reinforced, reinforced, reinforced over time. And so that's what we did. And hopefully, our purpose in doing this and then in passing it on to our next fellows is that we can continue. And Cal, welcome. Cal is our third um, career success fellow. He's from public management. So we're hoping that with the momentum we can eventually have a culture of career readiness and success in John Jay. Right? So the fellows will build and then pass it on to hopefully John Jay gets other fellows. Because we were the first for John Jay, but not the first at CUNY. So hopefully, and I'll stop here.
So, uh, questions, comments? Maggie? even though we did it in CJM, but I find that my grad students have some of the similar, is uh, similar issues and it may be COVID that's causing it. So like yesterday, for instance, in my grad class, after we dealt with some of the material in the class, we did a, a um, reading assignment, right? And in there, we already have people who are law enforcement, and they're talking amongst themselves all the time. In fact, one of my students in that class got an internship from another law enforcement. So we actually introduced the concepts early, but not concretely. Yesterday, we did a reading of um, retention and retainment of um, law enforcement um, people where they went through a document and they're reading some of the issues that apply, why are people not going to the NYPD, for instance, and they themselves now share their own experiences with that. So it depends on the class. Some classes, yes, you might have a specific focus, but because of the nature of our students, most already, in fact, in that class, all came with a background, military, police, law enforcement. So they were able to talk amongst themselves. So you just need to set the germ, I find, for like the grad um, students, but you could take it upon yourself to actually do something where you're pulling out some of those careers that you think are in your field and discussing them. Look at the skill sets. You can look at job ads and see the skill sets in those. And then try to bring it back to the classroom and develop some of those skills. Talk to the students. They know a lot about it. So, while this that we're presenting, and I'm presenting, I think it's more generic. The ideas are there for you to take it and apply it to your own field. If you're doing literature, for instance, which is reading effectively, taking notes, so or you write so that people can read it. Like the assignment that we did where it was a nine page article that we asked students to write a summary, a one page summary of, right? So it depends on what you particularly are doing in that major. But if you get the general idea, then it can be applied. Yeah, and I'm sorry that we couldn't do everything, right? We just had an hour and 20 minutes. But Maggie, I, I hope that you agree with me that this is very precise. I mean, this is, this is very focused. It's not, you know, uh, it, it's not at a very high level of us. I mean, you know, a formal, log a formal logic, informal logic, Critical thinking is going to help you, you know, everywhere, right? Yes. But now, now let me let me just just finish. Uh, we also have we're not alone here, right? The the college has fantastic resources, right? The Center for Career and Professional Development, for example, right? They have more specific, mm. right? Uh, they you know the college puts up uh, job fairs, for example, very successful. Uh, one of my favorite is the the law enforcement one, right? When when the end we. NYPD comes out with all that equipment and they, they're in the, in the hound square. But also, Maggie, we're working with, uh, with the library and the library has lib guides for specific, right, for specific uh, areas like criminal justice. Uh, we're working uh, on one for, for philosophy, for example. So it's a great question, right? Uh, yes. Uh, but if you have any ideas about 
right? How to integrate this and so on. Please uh, shoot us an email. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could share something also. I am from the English department, and uh, through the Career Success Fellowship, uh, you know how, you know, the, right now the humanities in some senses are under attack, right, in academia, and there's a lot of discussion around that. But a lot of data was shared within this fellowship uh, where, uh, you know, the job market situation of graduating English majors, for example, uh, you know, that data hasn't been integrated well. Uh, so some of the data actually often um, counter some of the common perceptions of like they followed uh, graduating of, uh, seniors with English majors through the next five years and then through the next 10 years and they tried to compare their salaries. All of this is available but in a scattered way. But what, some of the things that CUNY is trying to do through this is to kind of increase access and uh, you know make these these kinds of things available so that patterns are more visible. Um, you know, this year the Modern Language Association, MLA, um, has also done several case studies that are also available, uh, they're available online, where uh, they tried to look at a few, few universities and colleges where certain courses were morphed with different learning outcomes to make them more career friendly. So I mean, obviously we couldn't handle all disciplines and we don't represent all disciplines here, but basically this is an exploration of ways things could be done in order to have a higher impact on making students not just academically competent, but also to prepare them for careers. And so, um, that is something that we were trying to address, and of course, we're the first three at John Jay, so hopefully this work will continue. And I don't know if I touched on what you were uh, saying, but, and this can obviously be handled at different levels. Go ahead. Maggie, please. Um, so I know that, so the discussion has gone on in the criminal justice master's program about um, requiring that more, everyone, everyone knows that of transformation right, realizes is that uh, faculty right, need to get on board, bringing faculty on board because we are there, right? We have the students, we have their attention. Uh, and so this is something for departments, for programs, right? To get their head together and make those curricular decisions that as you know, can be very painful right here, here at the college just, you know, to, to try to change course or try to get a new course. Uh, but absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm thank, you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, that's for sure. And, and, and CUNY realizes it, and they have been trying to make the data available. Still, it's scattered, right? So we, we need ways to aggregate and, and then use it. Yeah. It's a process. Amy? Well, thank you very much to all three of you for the presentations, which are fantastic and I am being in philosophy and just talking with students and other faculty over the years one of the areas that I'm really interested in is in brainstorming more with other faculty who are here and not necessarily just in the humanities really about what what are the career paths for students who major in philosophy or major in English or major in history or humanities and justice or gender studies um, I, I think that over decades we've said something which is very aspirational, you know, well, our, our major prepares you for anything, um, <laughs> which of course I believe is true, but you know, the real question is for students who don't have these ready access to career paths, like what? You know, how do I get a job in 
a legislature, a legislator's office in Washington working on policy regarding affordable housing or something. I mean, I just, I would love to talk with people more about how we can generate, a, you know, a, a data bank of what these kinds of professional pathways are. Especially because people like myself, I mean, I've been working in education for 30 plus years. I, you know, that's fine, but I assume that lots of people don't want to go into education, and the many students who come into philosophy thinking they want to go to law school actually discover that they don't want to go to law school. So I would love to do that with anybody who's here or who wants to do that work. Mm -hmm. And I think a part of it is um, engaging employers. Yes. potential employers, and that's one of our high impact areas. Mm -hmm. It takes time to cultivate, right? But I think it's a worthwhile uh, effort to do it. And you could do it through your advisory boards. You could just do a lunch and discussion, you know, with these guys, and, and it, it kind of um, balloons from there. But that's a critical part, and that's why it's one of the high impact areas for us to do. Were you guys able to do that this year at all? We brought in people. Yeah. We developed, we, we have some contacts. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, we can pass on some information. That's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say something to students, exactly. Well, but students, it's okay if you don't have a straight arrow path. It's okay. I started in mathematics and computer science and then ended up in philosophy. So not everybody, <laughs> some, some people are like that, right? I, you know, I want to be a sociologist, and they know all their life they want to be a sociologist, and they don't want to. Uh, but but it's okay, you know, it's okay. But so we have we have students here, and uh, this is a forum where we're actually talking about career readiness and career success, keeping <coughs> the momentum going even post graduation. So I'd like to hear from students if you have ideas about what we, as faculty, could be doing in our classrooms to help you to get ready? What are some of the things that we should be looking at, or talking about, or engaging with? Well, one key thing is mentioning like, the resources that are available that we can use to look for internships and jobs. Like I, used, I was originally a Laborious student. I'm a computer science student. My professor mentioned a, uh, a uh, website called Tech and Mind. <coughs> he would push that to us, and I still utilize it to this day as a resource. Yeah. So it's like, in letting students know, because one of the hardest things about being a student is knowing what resources you have available exactly. to look for those kinds of jobs, for ways to advance your career. Yes, yes, thank you. And this is, uh, in the fellowship, we actually <coughs> learned about a lot of initiatives going on in other colleges, and this one of the colleges, I can't remember which one, like they built this beautiful career, career tree. It actually looks like a tree and it's online and students can click on the stems and the leaves and, and that takes them further to a different branch or a different leaf mm -hmm. and you know that's how it leads them on from one place to another and uh, so a lot other people are doing other things and you know this is a continuous process so you know there we have people next year too so hopefully these kinds of ideas can be incorporated. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> um, I agree with what you said about having to have a conversation about this. I always talk to students about developing skill sets that can be applied in a variety of careers. But I think the one thing that helps students go from, from college to career is before you graduate, because lots of students walk into my office in May and say, I'm about to graduate, what do I do next? One of the things you should do early as possible is begin to look out into the world. I know right now you're focused on school books, you're focused on tests, but look at the world. <clears throat> Find people who are doing interesting things. Find people who have the career you want. Go talk to them. Most people um, would be happy to talk to you about careers, um, and you will find that 99% of them did not make a direct path from yeah. point A to point Z. I was gonna be a phys ed teacher. Yeah. So I'm teaching <laughs> public administration now. Um, but if you begin to look out at the world, take advantage of opportunities to network, to go to things like this, to wander into professor's offices and ask questions. Um, when you go into an agency, you know, say hi to people and just begin to engage with the world. Read the newspapers because it isn't just 
your GPA. I think we all over-focus on GPA. We don't, we talk about getting a degree and not about getting an education. Your education is a passport. And you have to get out there and use it. You have to get out there and travel a little bit. So walk around the city, um, read things about agencies, go talk to people who work at these agencies. And the more you begin to look outside, the better you're gonna be able to see yourself in that place. And I think one of the big things that happens, particularly people who are not exposed to successful career people at a very early age. Um, you know, I, I was limited by my environment as a young child. Um, the later you wait to get out there, the harder it is for you to make that leap. So the earlier you begin to expose yourself to the world and, and get out there, you know, do whatever you want to do, go to museums, go to lecture, all sorts of things, those experiences will help you not only to consider career paths, but learn things that will help you in a job interview, or learn things that will connect you to people who know people who might connect you to a job someday. So the more you can do that, and the sooner you do that, the better. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kathy Crawford. I'm actually from the Center for Career and Professional Development. Friends. We're both from the Career Center, so um, we're around the corner, just next door to this place. So we really want to, we really are here as a resource um, for, to support you for any students, graduate students, undergrad students, to really support you in your career paths. Um, and for faculty, we really, we uh, the initiative, one of the initiatives we are com hopefully completing this year and by the summer is we've created integrated maps. So we've created integrated, we work with Academic um, Advisement Center to create integrated maps where it's, it's a, a, an actual map of like what students should be thinking about and required. At the same time, what should they be thinking about and required um, for, or not required, but what they should be thinking about in their path for career and getting them ready by the end uh, by their senior year. So to think about how to integrate those and how those two uh, work together, right? You should be thinking about your academic senior classes, but also what should you be thinking about mm -hmm. the same time preparing yourself for career. If that's an internship, if that's a micro internship, if that's whatever it is, right? So please utilize us as a resource. Um, we are a great resource for faculty and, and students and staff, and, and we even have a program called Epic for Faculty if you want an employer to come into your classroom um, to, to talk to students, but also it's more of a presentation for employers who are actually in the field to teach a, 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 like a lesson, right? So they can teach from the experience of being in the real world and in a, in a profession to come into your classroom and teach that lesson. So it's a partnership between the faculty. So please utilize us. We are here to support in any way we can. Uh, and, and, and moving for the next fellows who are coming in, we are definitely here to support for that as well. Bring, bring your classes to the fair. Yes. Come to the career fair. And that's Curry a great always place. brings her class to the fair. <laughs> and that's a great place in making mm -hmm. connections and learning about different jobs and, and careers that you can go into. We have over 100 employers come every fair. We have it every semester. So it's a great place to like learn even if you have no idea what you're interested in, you can, there's an array of places that you can, and people to talk to, and, and things to learn um, about what you could possibly do. And almost every week, there's a workshop or a executive in residence from someone in the field, and most often times, they're alumni. So please, encourage your students to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Anything yeah. else, students? <laughs> sure, sure. I never seen you scare so <laughs> But going back to your excellent question about internships, one of the goals, one of the goals uh, uh, for CUNY and the Chancellor's Office and the, use, and the Office of Transformation is to um, increase the number of internships, paid internships, mm -hmm. that are available for CUNY students. Uh, I think that the goal is a bit extremely ambitious because there are only like 60,000 internships in the whole city in the summer for students, but, but still it's a great goal and, and they're, you know, they're actually being able to, you know, prop up numbers. I, I, oh, oh, no. One minute. I, I was going to say that this career readiness and success, merging it with academics, mm -hmm. is coming. It's, it's, the, it's the way, it's the path. So we have to, if we're early embracers of it, we're better by the time other people get on board.
students need to help to guide us as we are also guiding them through this, right? And the more we talk, the better we'll get because we get ideas from everywhere. Yeah. I just want to say also there's five counselors in the office to serve as the whole college. So with the support of the faculty, I mean, it will make our job so much easier. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. So. <laughs> you can write your question there and we'll answer it. If you have questions or suggestions, have questions, please, comments, just please. drop it on the clipboard sheets and we'll take them off. <laughs>